Hello and welcome to Cyber Focus, your source for international business information. My name is Tim Smith and our guest today is Jeremy Courtney. Jeremy is founder and president of Preemptive Love Coalition, an international relief organization engaging on the front lines of the world's most polarizing conflicts in Iraq and Syria. A decade ago, at the height of the Iraq War, Jeremy and his wife, Jessica, chose to move to Iraq. Since then, Jeremy and his team have rushed emergency aid to several hundred thousand people in Iraq and Syria. Jeremy and Jessica also help refugees start small businesses to get back on their feet and promote peace across long-standing sectarian divides in the Middle East. Today, Jeremy will share about his experiences in Iraq, talk about the recent film release from Preemptive Love Coalition, and how he and his wife's organization is making a difference in the lives of their community and beyond. Jeremy. Thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. <laughs> and welcome to Indiana University. I, I believe it's your first time. It is. Beautiful campus. Yeah. Majestic. Fall Cor colors right now. Oh, yes. Best time. Fall and spring. Certainly beautiful times in Bloomington. And thank you so much for sharing your movie last night. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to watch. Mm. And I'm excited we get to talk a little bit about it today and a little bit about the work you and your wife are doing uh, around the world. Um, but specifically in the Middle East and Syria and Iraq. Um, maybe we start there with the movie. Tell us a little bit about it. What was the impetus for creating it, and what message do you hope to share through it? Yeah, so the film is called Love Anyway. It's a 30-minute documentary-style film that we made really to be a tool for the community because after living in the midst of war and conflict for the last decade plus, we've, we've learned quite a bit. Uh, my wife, me, our community around us, the organization that we've helped found and lead, Preemptive Love. And as we look from our home and our, our land in the Middle East where we spend most of our time and we look out across the landscape of the world to other places where we're working or other places where we move, the Korean Peninsula, U.S.-Mexico border, the streets of the United States, Europe and Europe's immigration conversations, we're seeing similar kind of fractures mm. that we've been seeing for the last decade in the run-up to war in Iraq, in the run-up to war in Syria, in the run-up to the Turkish invasion of Kurdish land in northeastern Syria and beyond. You, you can see the patterns, if you've lived through it enough times, you can see the patterns of what starts to be kind of the canary in the coal mine that precedes full-blown violence. And we see some of those things playing out in the English-speaking world today, in the United States today. So we wanted to encapsulate a lot of what we've learned and provoke a conversation that essentially asks this question, how can we heal all that's tearing us apart right now? Religious strife, political strife, cultural flashpoints and hot-button issues that are, are across all these different lines and conversations, it seems like we're being pulled more and more to the poles. And the, the middle ground where we meet each other and can have meaningful conversations seems harder and harder to mm -hmm. occupy. So that's what we do. We occupy those spaces, we bring people to those spaces, we broker opportunities and um, cooperatives and cooperations where we can come back into those spaces. We've been doing it for a decade in places like Iraq and Syria, Libya, Iran, Pakistan, Korean Peninsula. So we wanted to bring some of that um, forward into U.S. communities as we approach an election year. And we've been, the, the film has released, loveanyway.com, a couple weeks ago. We've been touring it around the country and the conversations that it has sort of provoked and allowed to happen have been very encouraging. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. So tell me a little bit about its genesis. I believe your book came out recently of the same title. Same title, different, uh, it's different. You know, it doesn't, it's not a mirror image of the mm -hmm. documentary film or the, the campaign film, but, but in many ways the, the goal of the book is the same as well. It's, it's trying to cast a vision out of the way things are right now, mm -hmm. which I sort of portray in the book, which is a, it's kind of a meta-narrative and a, a series of individual stories 
but the, in the book I cast this sort of realm that we all seem to be tyrannized by. Mm -hmm. The realm is called the way things are, and we're trying, it seems, many of us to get out of the way things are and attain to the more beautiful world mm -hmm. our hearts know is possible. Um, and so the book, largely through telling a, a series of historical stories, cast a vision for what I think many of us are reaching toward. We, we want out of this polarized place where no one quite feels like we're standing on equal ground, mm. um, whether it's white nationalists who feel like something's being taken away from them, mm. or whether it's Black Lives Matter activists feeling like they've never stood on equal ground in their entire lives, and everyone in between these kinds of things, we're all essentially saying something similar. Life's not fair, and I'm not happy with it. Mm. So how can we, can we find a way back to each other when those are our predominating worldviews? Mm. Thank you. In the academy, we're looking to put more theory into practice because when we lead students to that opportunity to serve another, I think good things happen. Yeah. And we probably have been guilty for far too many decades to wax rhetoric within uh, the classroom, yeah. certainly, which there's value in this as well. But um, students are leaning on us and sharing with me, I want to be part of the solution. Yeah. Help me be part of the solution. Provide a vehicle to do so. Tell me a little bit about how your organization may provide opportunity for people to do so. Yeah, so focus me in here. Which, which slice of this conversation yeah. do you want to focus on? Because we've, we've talked about, I've, I've hinted at racism and yeah. you know, cultural flashpoints and things like that. Maybe I'd bring it back to your goals as an organization. What, what engagement vehicle for young people do you see being the priority for your organization? Yeah. So as an organization, we exist to end war. Mm. That's the big idea, the big mm. dream, the North Star, to end war. But admittedly, that can sound rather impractical or pie in the sky. But what we've seen on the front lines, which is immensely practical, there's no philosophizing you know, when you're getting shot at. Um, what we've seen on the front lines of it is that there's sort of two or three main ways that we think about this. Number one, you have to respond fast mm -hmm. when violence breaks out because violence spreads like a disease from one person to another, from one community to mm -hmm. another. You see someone get killed, that forces you to make a decision. Am I with this side or that side? Am I for that killing or against that killing? Was it justified, was it not? So responding fast when lives are on the line is an important part of how we stop the spread of violence. So we do that in places like Iraq and Syria, uh, U.S.-Mexico border with regard to immigration, we respond fast with relief. Mm whether that's a relief shelter, food, medical support when lives are on the line. Relief is a lot of what we do. The second thing we do is we try to provide help that lasts, meaning it's not enough to just give handouts, it's mm -hmm. not enough to just respond quickly, but then turn your back on a group mm -hmm. of people over time. It takes years, decades, maybe even generations to lift people up out of the ditches that we've helped dig mm. and put them in in the first place. So job creation, economic development is a really important part in how we stop the spread of violence because it, it essentially amounts to protecting the vulnerable. Mm. Um, violence likes to spread into the most vulnerable communities. And those who are economically insulated mm. are actually insulated from violence coming into their lives. Mm -hmm. we, we can use our money and our positions and our institutions to keep violence out. But when you're vulnerable and you don't have jobs and you can't put food on the table, you're more easily recruited into violence. Mm -hmm. Whether that's an inner city gang in LA or Chicago, whether that's an ISIS type ideological group in Iraq or Syria, or whether that's a white nationalist group in rural Indiana, mm -hmm. uh, poverty and all that kind of stuff does play a role. So economic development has been proven to reduce violence. Mm. And so we spent a lot of time and effort there. And then the most, at once the most philosophical and practical intersection of it all is what we say um, changing the ideas that lead to war. Mm. We call that community. We, we invest in relationship, we bring people together. Some people call it peacemaking, some people call it reconciliation work. Um, 
but there's no amount of money and there's no amount of just emergency relief or anything like that that can keep us out of war if we don't change our ideas, if we don't change who we are, if mm -hmm. we don't how we change how we think about each other and how we relate to each other. And again, that can sound very philosophical, but it's actually very practical, very practical. As we draw near to each other, we change. Mm. And a lot of what is at stake right now is, is that we're, dr we're pushing away from each other. So practical tools, we build tools and we, we have programs that help bring people back together. Mm. Um, so I'll pause there, but yeah. that's a lot of what we do. Thank you. In the movie, your wife Jessica says, our goal in preemptive love is to see whole communities. And the only way to get to whole communities is to stand with them. Walk us through how you and your organization, your wife, your children, are standing with people and working to get there. Yeah, so I think in what she's talking about there, I think she says stand with them through the whole process. Mm. And what she was hinting at in that, what she was talking about in that moment is from the moment the bomb falls and destroys a village to however many years down the line when that village is built back up, they're, they're going to need help. They're mm. going to need friends. They're going to need support. They're going to need an international network to mm. find themselves back in a whole place. If you don't show up on the front lines for people when they're getting shot at and you only come to their aid mm. once it's safe, they might rightly have some suspicion towards you. Oh, mm -hmm. oh now you show up. Now you show up that, that you want to burnish your brand a little bit now that we're not in danger anymore. Mm. And you want to come in and leverage your economic development or your investments or your charity to build us back up now that everything's safe. Where were you when we were getting shot at? And this, this testimony could be for black communities in the U.S., could be for Muslim communities in the U.S., could be for Yazidi communities in Iraq. Like the, the sense that minorities have been left behind and then people with power come in magnanimously to lift mm -hmm. them up out of their dire situation after the coast is cleared, mm -hmm. that's an age-old critique of people with power and privilege mm -hmm. and, and resources. So it's been very important to us to say, no, we'll come in and get shot at with you. Mm -hmm. We'll come put our lives on the line with you. You want to see our receipts? We're not just going to show them to you after the fact. We'll come earn our stripes mm. in the fray with you. Well, then when you emerge out of violence together, mm. you're, you're, you're bonded together in a mm. new way. So when we emerge out of the relief era or season, uh, and want to, there, when the coast clears enough that we can start talking about jobs and economic development mm -hmm. and reconciliation and things like that, we've got the credibility together mm -hmm. between us. We've got the trust together between mm -hmm. us to do that. Another quick thing I'll say is, even the way I just framed that up is a little misleading because we don't think purely linearly about some of this stuff. It's not first you stop the bleeding, mm -hmm. then you move into an era of job mm -hmm. creation, mm -hmm. then after all the, all the things are lined up, we talk about reconciliation and have some truth and, truth and reconciliation commission. You know? mm -hmm. That's not how we do it. I think that's a lot of how the world has approached it mm -hmm. for many years. Well, we just, we just have to like, stop the bleeding right now. We can't really worry about reconciliation right now. And we've just tried to move the reconciliation piece to the very beginning mm -hmm. and say how we show up on the front lines on day one, if it's not a reconciling effort, then we're off on a bad foot. Mm. from the very first moment. Move the jobs to day one. Mm. If all we're doing is giving handouts from day one and not figuring out how to rebuild and shore up institutions and keep money in local economies, then we're off on a bad foot. Mm. If we just dump U.S. food aid into a community at war, then we literally put all the other food sellers out of business. Mm -hmm. All in the name of what? Aid? Charity? Helping? We decimate the very economies mm -hmm. that we aim to claim to help. So we've tried to just pile it all in and take a more holistic approach from day one. That's mm -hmm. part of what Jessica meant when she said stand with them through the whole process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I certainly didn't want to misquote Jessica. No, no. Thank you for adding, it's just, it's expanding. A, it's why. I think and thank you. That. Thank you for outlining that very much. 
So please tell us about the entrepreneurial activity that Preemptive Love is a part of. Uh, I believe you've established training centers which are contributing to peace and prosperity in Iraq. Uh, help us better understand what they look like. So our jobs program has three main pillars to it. One we would call like individual makers. Mm -hmm. This is basket weaving, candle making, soap making kind of stuff, including one guy who runs a fruit stand at the end of his street. It's, it's a sole entrepreneur, sole proprietorship sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so we stand up a lot of businesses like that, thousands of businesses like that through Great. small grants, just helping people get back on their feet. Typically, they know what they're doing. They have a vision. They have a dream. Um, they did it before, mm -hmm. and a, a bomb or a tank took out their little corner mm -hmm. shop. They know how to get it back up and running. They just, they just need a thousand dollars. You know, so we do that a lot of that. Um, the second major pillar would be more of a co-op sort of mm -hmm. model, where we're bringing people together and they're harnessing and leveraging resources to get greater reach and you know greater economies of scale. And then the third major pillar is what we call workforce development. This mm -hmm. is aims to be at scale, thousands of jobs at a time. Um, typically in the tech sector, the, the tech sector is where we're investing the majority of these efforts right now. By trying to bring, really trying to upgrade places like uh, Iraq, Syria, Mexico, bringing them forward into a digital era that they've not mm. fully attained to yet, and there's still a wide open field you know, for us together to develop this entire industry. So our WorkWell program um, does a number of things, but one of the things I'm most excited about is we broker deals with major data players like a Google, for example, or a Cisco, and we, we sell our services to, to a major data player. They give us a batch of data that they mm -hmm. want processed, annotated, or analyzed, or marked up, identified in some way, they dump it into our platform, and then we bring our refugee friends to the platform, and with nothing but a smartphone mm. and a Wi-Fi connection from their tent on the run, mm. they can hook into our platform and process data for a Google, for example. Mm. Annotate a photo, identify of this, is this a car or a cat, mm. uh, circle all the street lights in this photo, things like that. And in so doing, of course, they are training the algorithms mm. at Google so that eventually that task will no longer be in the data set. That the machines will learn that set mm. and Google will move on to another algorithmic artificial intelligence mm. machine learning thing that they're trying to train. And our refugee workforce or our displaced workforce will be engaging that work mm. next. Are on the refugee side and the host community side that we're working with, in many cases, they're earning more money than their neighbors mm. who are working government jobs, um, which is huge given the complications that refugees often find mm. earning money, getting jobs while on the run, mm. while in a precarious position. And with nothing but a smartphone, they can actually leave that tent mm. and move to the next country they can get resettled, they can do any number of things, but they still have their job with them on their phone. Mm. So as their life is precarious and you know they're trying to figure out how everything's gonna sort out and shake out for them, they keep their job, mm. they keep their work on the platform. Mm. It's an innovation that we think could, could be a game changer because look, the immigration and refugee displacement stuff going on around the world is not looking to change mm. anytime soon. It's not merely driven by the, the big wars like Assyria or, or in Iraq. It's driven by climate change. It's driven by all kinds of things like that. So we're going to see a lot of displacement, and we need new job solutions for mm -hmm. those on the run for their lives. And I like that you've, de dealt, you've developed this engagement strategy to absolutely meet them where they are and give them something uh, and it's very inspiring Jeremy thank you very much and I wish we had more time to discuss further uh, your many years of being on the ground and being a part of the community that has not only 
uh, added value to your personal lives, but has dictated much of your professional life uh, on the global stage. I look forward to reading your book and uh, enjoyed the movie so very much. I wish you all safety and I wish you well-being, and I'm excited about the further am impact your group will have uh, on the global stage. Let's continue the discussion. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming in yeah. today. Thanks for tuning in. If you have any comments or suggestions for future topics, please let us know at cyber, that's C-I-B-E-R, at indiana.edu.